Welcome, Alana Woolley, OTD student here, with an example of appraising a qualitative research study for its relevance to occupational therapy practice. We're going to be assessing this research using both a hierarchical model and a checklist model to help us determine how much weight to give to the findings of this study. The article that we'll be looking at is titled User Experiences of Digital Prostheses in Daily Functioning in People with an Amputation of Thumb or Finger, and it's brought to us by the Journal of Hand Therapy. There is an entire OT potential course on this article that you can check out if you're interested to get some more context about the study. But for now, let's jump into the models. This study is fairly straightforward to place on our levels of evidence hierarchy, as the method section pretty clearly states that this is a descriptive study with a phenomenological approach. This situates the study squarely in level three. However, I also noticed that while the researchers set out to include a larger sample, they ultimately ended up with only four participants. This very small sample size limits how generalizable I would consider the study. And so on our hierarchy, I would actually place the study closer to level four. So not very strong evidence for practice. Let's move over to our checklist model to see if we can pull out some more nuance about the strength of this study. Starting with researcher reflexivity, or in other words, how well the researchers acknowledge their own rules and the potential for bias in the study. In this case, the sample was actually recruited from the rehab facility that the researcher worked at. So the participants were well aware that the researcher was a hand therapist. One participant was even a former patient of the interviewer. They did take some steps to reduce this bias by asking participants to share as if they were speaking to someone who didn't know so much about prostheses. They also had participants verify both a verbal summary of the conversation and a transcript of the interview which are examples of member checking. Members were not asked to verify themes or findings from the study, and I do have some lingering questions about the researcher's role in this clinic, since I didn't see a declaration of interest. But overall, I would say this is pretty fair reflexivity for the study's aims and design. Other than participating in interviews and the member checking I just described, there is very limited stakeholder involvement in this study. Individuals who actually use digital prostheses weren't involved in defining the research question, writing interview questions, or analyzing the results. I felt like the descriptive richness was strong in this article. We provided pretty clear protocols for data collection and analysis, including the full analysis framework. I felt like I could really picture exactly how the researchers went about this study. For only four participants, we are provided well-organized inclusion and exclusion criteria, detailed demographic data, and over two pages of primary quotes. I also really appreciate when researchers include the interview questions in the study. As far as methodology, I'm looking at whether or not the study design makes sense given the aims of the research, whether the researchers utilize existing frameworks, here they use the interpretive phenomenological analysis approach. And something I really look for in qualitative research is how iterative the findings and methods are. In other words, do the researchers take what they've learned from the analysis to change how they go back and capture more data, which I consider to be a feature of excellent qualitative research. It looks like this study just involved one round of interviews, so there wasn't really opportunities for iteration. Is this the most robust qualitative methodology? No. But for the purposes of a small-scale descriptive study, this is probably adequate as a starting point for more research. Finally, when you consume a research article, clinical relevance is likely at the top of your mind. It doesn't really matter how strong a piece of evidence is if it just doesn't have any clinical importance to you. In this example, the study's findings definitely make sense based on what I already know. I don't currently work with any clients who utilize digital prostheses, but just knowing how common digital amputations are, I likely will encounter clients who would benefit from this information. To summarize, this study provides low quality evidence for practice. In other words, I would not use this study to justify major changes in practice or policy without the support of additional evidence. And while I now feel more enlightened about the topic, I would definitely re still refer my clients out to a hand therapist or other prosthetic specialist for this type of intervention. 
The purpose of the study was really to bring previously unheard voices into the scientific literature on this subject by describing the user experience of digital prostheses. So while the evidence overall is low, I found it to be appropriate for the study's purpose and felt like the researchers reached their aim. Even though we can't reasonably generalize these findings to all digital prosthesis user experiences, this study still provided me with new insights into the user experience with these tools. I am walking away from this study with a better understanding of the current options for digital prostheses, fewer assumptions about the functionality of these tools, and a greater awareness of the possibility for differences in priorities between therapists and their patients. Thank you for watching. I hope this has been a helpful example of assessing a qualitative study for its relevance to OT practice.